Yeah, everybody, thanks for coming to um, the second installment of four workshops in our series. Um, very excited um, about the workshop today. Um, if you missed the workshop last week, it was with a good friend and uh, family, Billy Tuggle of Chicago, um, who um, is a um, world-class haiku champion and, um, uh, and is an incredible writer and a dear close friend. So, um, and today, we're doing a workshop. Um, at the end, we're going to talk a little bit more about other activities going on that um, involve the Muhammad Ali series of um, uh, events that Keat and the Ink people are putting on. And there's the invite for um, for uh, for everybody to come in. So, um, yeah, we're going to start today with a clip. Um, and this is from, is this from Katie, the um, documentary? Yeah, it is from the documentary. And if you haven't seen it, the documentary, it's fabulous. Um, it's pretty in depth and they still, it's still offered if you wanna just go in and poke around and watch. Um, and I think their conversations are also up. I highly recommend the documentary though. It's you're going to learn all sorts of things about Muhammad Ali that maybe you knew or you didn't know. Um, Ken Burns is really good at, and, and Sarah Burns and David are all really good at going out and interviewing people, his daughters and his friends. It's incredible. Um, yeah, it's really good. I highly recommend um, if any of you have ever seen a Ken Burns documentary, this is right in line with, um, a lot of the stuff that he produces. So um, it's very good, very well done. Um, and then, yeah, super informative and um, kind of really takes this one dimensional figure or um, icon that we have and really um, gives this person a very multi dimensional um, perspective and also uh, really doesn't shy away from some of the things that um that Muhammad Ali struggled with in his life Two weeks later, an all-white Houston jury found Ali guilty of refusing the draft. The judge, ignoring the more lenient recommendation of the prosecutor, sentenced him to the maximum, five years in prison and a $10,000 fine. And he would have to surrender his passport. Ali's lawyers immediately filed an appeal, prepared to go all the way to the Supreme Court if necessary a process that could take years. Ali remained free, but without his title or a license to box. He fully expected that he would one day go to jail for his beliefs. We who are followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the religion of Islam, we believe in obeying the laws of the land. We are taught to obey the laws of the land as long as it don't conflict with our religious beliefs. Will you go into service as such? This would be a thousand percent against the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the religion of Islam, and the Holy Quran, the holy book that we believe in. This will all be denouncing and defying everything that I stand for. This would mean, of course, that you stand the chance of going to jail as a result of not going into service. You well, whatever the punishment, whatever the persecution is for standing up for my religious beliefs, even if it means facing machine gun fire that day, I will face it before denouncing Elijah Muhammad and the religion of Islam. I'm ready to die. When I think about him saying, if they want to put me before a firing squad tomorrow, I'm ready to die before I abandon my religion. Um, 
that's it. You can't teach that kind of thing in lectures, in books. That kind of thing has to be modeled. And models turn into traditions. And traditions provide people with the mechanical memory to do the right thing. That's what Muhammad Ali represented in that moment. I mean, anybody now faced with a major decision in which the right way is clear and the wrong way is clear, but the consequences are dire, now they have a model that they can fall back on psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. That's what Muhammad Ali represented in that moment. And that, to me, that moment will live on forever. Thank you for, uh, for showing that clip. That is a clip from the documentary. Um, once again, I highly recommend that you watch the whole thing. Um, it's incredible and um, really gives a really good perspective and um, uh, a very good broad view of this person that we um, really look to as a hero. So kind of what that is about is, um, is Muhammad Ali's belief system, which was an incredibly big part of who he was as a person and also who he was just in the ring and everywhere in his life. Um, um, he's been known to say that uh, being a fighter, being a boxer is just a small part of who he is. And that's really true. And um, I think that that's true for all of us. I think that our job or even what people know us for, even if it isn't related to how we earn money, that is a part of us. And it's not the whole part, but it's definitely significant. Um, he um, definitely um, struggled with religion later in life. He was, um, he said that um, when he was younger, he really, um, you know, bent the religion to his needs and desires and really didn't take it as seriously as he did later in life. And when he was older, he really understood and recognized that this was not about making his life good or um, it wasn't performative. It was a deep and meaningful personal journey that he took very seriously in um, uh, living for the pleasure of Allah, as he put it. Um, bringing that into today's climate, um, you know, we have our social media and we have our social climate and, um, the last decade or so accountability has been a really hot button. Um, lately I've noticed that, um, social justice and, um, accountability is definitely performative and um, there's a lot of struggle with that. So um, doing things for others versus doing things for others for the performance of it is kind of like what we were talking about him struggling with that earlier feeling of just being really involved in the religion but not really adhering to the parts of that religion that make things more difficult for you. And so that's what we're talking about now, like doing the social work and doing the social justice and, and um, helping others is as a way of, of um, kind of checking a box that you've done good things. And so you're going to go up to heaven or whatever, as opposed to doing those good things because it's the right thing to do. Um, the quote for today's workshop is... The service you do for others is the rent you pay for your room here on earth. Um, and that's a big deal, you know, that he had a very, uh, Muhammad Ali had a very um, balanced way to, um, to see things. He felt like there was somebody that, um, you know, when you died, tallied up all the good things in your life and tallied up all the bad things in your life. And that was how you, um, that was how you were decided which place you would go. And so he was very mindful of that. He tallied up 
the things in his life that were bad and the things in his life that he did that counterbalanced that. And his goal was to end on the good side. Um, I don't know personally if he felt he made that. I think a lot of us personally feel like he definitely made that because we see all the good that he did that continues to reverberate out past him in his lifetime. Um, he was also awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2005. And um, that was a really big deal because that was the government who, as you saw from the clip, um, basically persecuted him for his beliefs and his nonviolent beliefs specifically. Um, that was the government turning around and saying that he was in fact deserving of this Medal of Freedom, which is a very high, um, a word that you can get from the government. Um, so in thinking about the rent that we pay um, for our room here on earth, I'd like to start um, sort of in the same fashion that Billy did. Thank you for coming in, Billy, um, with a poem. And then I'll give you a prompt. And I'd like for you guys to take some time to really think about that and write um, and what kind of what you think about that. And then I definitely want to um, open that up to some dialogue about um, your thoughts about this, um, this concept of, um, of social justice and, and also um, social work, not necessarily um, as a position, but just as a human being. So for Muhammad Ali, you know, ironically, he was a fighter and his job was actually quite violent, but he was a nonviolent person and um, exhibited that in his everyday life. So today's workshop isn't really about his technical skills and his boxing and his small part of him. It's about that bigger, that bigger piece and how he took that everywhere he went. And some of the things he said later in life about how he wished he'd talk to people differently or he wished he'd treated somebody differently and he wished that he could apologize to that person because he realized later that he wasn't using that bigger picture. He was acting out of this tiny little piece. And I think we all do that. Um, you know, we all have things where, you know, we have to, to act a certain way because we're in this job role, but um, trying to incorporate what he felt was important, which was to have that service all the time in your mind. You know, he gave away money to his family and his friends. He gave away money and, and um, brought joy to people. And that was important to him. That was just really important to him. He didn't care about um, becoming the richest person and, um, you know, buying big houses and things like that. Like it was more important to him to make people happy and bring people joy and make people feel safe. And, um, and that, was, that was his goal. Um, so I'm gonna read this poem. This is by uh, my stepdad, his name is Richard Kresch. He um, also had a um, debilitating illness and was also very socially conscious. He was a um, lawyer in Oakland um, for the whole time that I knew him. He was also a Buddhist. He was a criminal defense attorney. So most of his clients were um, like gangbangers in Oakland and um, people that um, he took a lot of pro bono cases. So like all of his clients, like they were awarded to him by the state um, and they were really high profile cases. These are people that, um, you know, never expected to see freedom after the trial. Um, but he never treated any one of his clients like he wasn't going to defend them with every single thing he had. He um, also, outside of that environment, was a very much a Buddhist in his heart and um, spent quite a bit of time really thinking about some of the things that he did as a younger man that were aggressive or violent or coming from this place of being a social activist that was this very small place without in company, uh, um, without bringing through all of the other aspects of his heart, which was 
and he was essentially nonviolent. So from his book, At the End of Time, this book is called Caregiver Sutra. You bring cut flowers to my bedside. Walk for me in the garden. Carry nature inside our walls. The impossible you attempt daily because the natural is beyond my grasp. A struggle to keep equality in our equation. My needs expanding exponentially as my ability declines along with your reserves. We need congruence to thread this needle, synchronicity, mental strength, graceful determination, love, and still the fabric unravels. A list of attributes or requirements can only be an exercise, a substitute or preparation for the reality to be encountered. Impermanence must be remembered by caregiver and recipient. Journey is destination, arrival inevitable. So this poem is about somebody who spent their whole life working for other people and trying to do things for other people at a point now where he needs to be taken care of and how hard that is knowing that he's done that for somebody else. Now he has to be the one using that resource of somebody that he loves. Um, and it is very hard being a caregiver. I think um, we all have a different amount of money or of rent that we feel we have to pay for our room here on earth. Some of us feel our rent is much higher. Other people feel our rent is pretty small. I think I can speak for everybody in, um, in this group. Everybody here pays pretty steep rent. You know, all of you do a lot for other people. And um, it's not just about, um, you know, you do this social thing and then you've done it and you feel great and you move on with your life. The poem is about how it takes something from you. And that's what the prompt is about today. I want you to write a prompt um, about um, the cost of the rent that you pay. And you can write in, you can write in uh, any form that you choose. You can share, you don't have to share. Um, but that's the, that's the prompt for today. So you're gonna write about the cost of the rent that you pay for your room here on earth. You can talk about, um, you know, um, physical cost. You can talk about emotional cost, but, it's not about writing about the service. It's about writing what the service takes from you. So that is the writing prompt. One, two, three, go. And I'll give you, uh, let's say 15 minutes. Okay, so that wraps up our um, writing time for right now. Um, and so the next thing I wanted to do was I wanted to read another poem. And while I'm reading this poem, I want you to think about or maybe write down five words from the poem that you can use as a writing prompt for a future little writing project of your very own. And while I'm reading the second poem, if you have to edit your work or whatever, that's totally fine. No judgment here. Um, but this is another poem about service and sort of in theme with the prompt that um, for today. This is a poem that I wrote that is uh, going to be published pretty soon in something about the mailbox, uh, which is really cool. It's called This Good Life. I have a good life. 
sick people come to see me, I let them imagine it is perfect. There is a garden with green grass around it. We have pets, a mortgage payment. We're in the business of helping others, my person and I. I have a good life. It is in my nature to imagine it without love, how it would break my branches, crush me like a heavyweight, sick people getting sicker. In my dreams, I'm unrecognizable. I have a good life. A slow dance poem across our kitchen floor while old knives dig into me like the traumas they are. Forget where I am and that I do not have to be scared anymore. I have a good life. There is a dog who is a good boy, forgets his manners sometimes. There is a good boy who forgets like me where he is sometimes. Seems like we cry a lot or maybe it's too little. We need to more often. I am healthy now. I eat every day, pay attention to speed limits. My man never forgets this good life I have. We share, he provides, sees only wife, children, pets, love, even though his soul is a chipped tooth like mine. I see tsunamis, school shootings, drug overdoses. My little boy is just not happy. Like before, my oldest boy, a woven basket, they are a beautiful pattern, holds us together. Imagine smile and photo with dates underneath before our first date and every time he leaves. It is in my nature to break and crumble, to plan for a tsunami while I water our garden, to forget where I am, to let old knives dig. I have a good life. Sick people come to see me. It is in my nature to imagine they are perfect. So that is about the toll that it takes on me personally to be a caregiver, to help sick people, sometimes to be there when they're dying to um, hear about them dying, and that's how you know they're not coming to see you today, um, to meet people where they're at, to help somebody that's angry at you. All of that is the rent that I pay for my room here. And it is a toll. It does take something from me to do those things, but it's important and it's like, Muhammad Ali says, you know, um, he felt like religion is about love. It's not about, you know, a doctrine or whatever. He um, believed that his religion was a religion of the heart. He told his daughter that rivers, lakes, and streams are all called different things, but they all, they all contain water and all religions contain truth. And I found that very beautiful. And the reason I bring up religion is because that's how he incorporated service into others is through his religion. And I bring that about through my job, but also in poetry. So it's really important to me to, um, to show up for other people that are struggling, um, that maybe don't have the capacity at that moment to go get up on stage in front of a crowd of people and share something personal, but they can relate to somebody on stage who's doing that. And I consider that also to be service, you know, to be in the community and be vulnerable and share my experiences, even if they're hard to look at, because other people that feel alone or Maybe a younger version of me that felt alone um, can look at that and connect with somebody and say, there's somebody else in the world and I don't have to feel alone about that anymore or um, I can make it to that place. So those are the things um, that I wrote about. And um, yeah, please feel free to um, share what you wrote or um, if you want to talk about the service that you do, that's also um, 
highly encouraged. I would love to hear from you guys now at this point. Everybody's so quiet. Hi. I'm, um, let me see what I look like with my video on. I'm out on our deck. And, <laughs> I can see yep. two tiny little eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the glint off my glasses. So let's do this. Okay. There, now you just look like you're scratching your chin and I can imagine your <laughs> mouth moving. This is actually me at the last National Poetry Slam hosting group piece finals in my high school auditorium. So I got my revenge. I became a rock star for poetry. Yes. Um, so I never thought that I'd be writing a Muhammad Ali persona poem. Uh, and what I basically came up with was a little bit of a concept of a sketch. And I think what I'm going to do to flesh this out is to talk about myself uh, kind of as a reflection. But I had 10 lines uh, that directly spoke to Muhammad Ali's experience. <clears throat> it only cost me the World Heavyweight Championship and half a decade of wages and half a decade of dignity and half a decade and friends and God and possibly my health and family and God, but not my person, not my persona, not my give gear or my knockout smile, not battling the bullies of Babylon, making opponents political and sporting babble not my fight for me or you. And that's kind of where I left off. Yeah. Prison, people don't, um, people who have never been to prison or don't know somebody who has been incarcerated have no concept of what it takes from you. Um, earlier today, I saw, um, or earlier this week, I should say, I saw a person who um, had, you know, I mean, it's like almost guaranteed that people that have been incarcerated are going to have PTSD in relation to medical appointments. That's just a guarantee because it is so awful and horrible to go to the doctor when you're in jail or after coming out um, that you just, you just have trauma from that you just experience trauma from that it's not it's not ever a situation where you just go for a checkup and everything's great you know um i can't even imagine what it must have been like for him to be in prison for five years and i mean the moment he said i would die i would I, like that in that clip it was incredible it was um it was exactly that he was like if they put me up in front of the firing squad today i'd do it well you know he was not incarcerated but when you have uh his political angle along with the celebrity that he cut he was somebody who i mean even as he went from congressional hearings to talk shows to whatever he was followed he was trailed everywhere and he was still basically very much you know um restrained because he was not able to do what it was he wanted to do or that he felt like key. he was here for that's so i mean it was definitely uh, a social prison it was yeah. definitely um you know a political uh uh what's the word i'm looking for an abstract prison it might have you know i don't know personally, but it might have been more meaningful to take away his ability to box and his title. Yeah. You know, than to put him in a, a, a square cage and then let him go. Yeah. You know, um, that's his life's dream. That whole thing about the red bicycle, you know, yeah. like who he was, it might've been a, a small part, but it was still so integral. And then they couldn't, I mean, the, the, the worst part for, you know, the man, the powers that be was that they literally could not stop him from fighting his way back and, and into a greater prominence. And that to me is the most powerful part of what really was, 
in a number of years, a relatively small part of life. And this man lived like for a very, very long time and gave up, he gave up a lot in a short amount of time, but the return, the return on it for the rest of the world uh, was more, more than a thousandfold. Absolutely. That, um, that was really well said in the documentary. Um, it was a, uh, like almost like a, 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 a point at which people could refer to of a person who stood up for what they believed in, especially a black man who stood up for what he believed in against a white government. I mean, incredible, incredibly strong. I, I mean, just the convictions of being able to be like, no, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna fight this war that has nothing to do with me. It goes against everything I believe as a person, you know, it was quite powerful. And um, yeah, I definitely, um, it's easy to, like we were talking about earlier, it's easier to go on social media and be like, oh, I'm gonna do all these things or yes, I support all of these movements. And then it's a whole other thing in your real life to make those sacrifices, you know, I mean, like he made those sacrifices. It wasn't just the, you know, um, I mean, I believe looking at that video, I believe 100% he would have died for those belief systems at the time at his young age and through the rest of his life. Um, I've known lots of people, um, my stepdad included, um, who felt that strongly about their belief system. And um, it's quite powerful to be around people that would give everything for that. So, um, yeah. My daughter just messaged me, are you busy? I have to say, yes, we're busy. Um, yeah, I really, um, I really liked the the quote we used today, or the the clip that we used today. Um, I've watched the documentary; it's pretty amazing. I think you guys should all check it out. Um, so far, it's my favorite in our hero series. Um, and um, yeah, so if anybody else wants to read, um, please do. My poem is a little bit older, but it is about being a nurse in the pandemic. Um, and um, I have been a caregiver for friends who have died. That's um, probably, I would say the most challenging for me. Um, and it's not just about, you know, the stuff that I wrote about and the stuff that I read earlier is about sort of physical care but I think there's a lot of ways to care for others. Um, Muhammad Ali gave away money and, and brought people food and brought them joy, just, just went and visited people and like crowds would come around him and he would just laugh and giggle and, and make people laugh and tell jokes and just made people happy. And that was a moment those people, millions of people could just take with them for the rest of their lives. Like I met that person, you know, I laughed with that person and how incredible, what a gift, you know? What an incredible gift. And then of course, to his own children, you know, his own daughters, he gave quite a bit. He always um, made them priority and um, um, felt that it was very important to him to be a father and take them with him when he, went on big trips and, and did stuff like that. So um, he was very much um, paying his rent that way also, I think. I know Dylan is not gonna read. He um, might be all um, read it out from Tuesday. <laughs> um, really quickly too, I wanted to talk about um, the other things that we have going on. So there's a really cool, um, let me look it up actually. There's a really cool um, uh, sort of, I guess it's a competition about, um, or not a competition, it's um, 
like you can you can submit to enter into an art and poetry um, uh, collection. And it's called Stand Up and Be Counted. Which is another quote. Um, I believe. I just want to get it right. It's put on by um, ink the people. ink people. There you go. Is that right, Katie? Yeah, that's right. Ink people. And it's not a quote. Oh, it's just a saying. Stand up, yeah. So the um, deadline to submit for that, it's, is it November 17th? Did I get that right? November 19th. You were close. Oh, so <laughs> Maybe I should have the November 17th. There you go. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, I, um, I'm excited about that. So um, any of the things that people write, um, even if you don't share them today, I would love it if you finished what you wrote and submitted it so that we can make a chapbook from the series of workshops. Um, we can include the poems that the presenters shared if um, the permission is given by the author. Um, and um, yeah, I think that would be really cool um, to have a book um, anybody that wanted a copy, of course, I would provide one for you. I have no problem with that at all. Um, yeah, I think that would be really neat. And then, um, and then you could be published in, in a thing that you did. So I highly recommend writing something. And um, basically, it would just be an email. You could probably reply to the invitation Katie, would that be a good way to do it? Is just reply to the Zoom in invitation that you got from your email. Yeah, if you'd like, I can send details out or you can go to, yeah, yes, that works. You guys have my, here, I'll put my face on maybe. <laughs> I don't know if I'm on. You're on, we okay. see you. Um, yeah, it would be great if you have questions, email me. Um, the chat book sounds really exciting. I think it's going to be fun. And I think, um, yeah, I'm excited to hear what you guys think and what you guys sort of um, take away from this workshop, even if it's later on. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing to um, think about the service that you do and um, have that be your focus. And it's a whole different thing to think about the cost that it takes from you and um, how to manage that in the rest of your life. Um, I think all of us have um, things that we do for other people. It doesn't have to be medical. <laughs> you know, everybody, certainly everybody that I know um, I can think of at least five things right off the top of my head that they do for other people that has nothing to do with their own agenda. And, um, you know, that's, that's kind of, you know, what I'm talking about today. So. Okay, well, you guys are super quiet. Does anybody, yay, hi, Jazz. Hi, I came outside to read and there might be, um, background sound it might be windy it's definitely cold out here but <laughs> um I as as I shared before I'm I'm a little shy and I'm in a public place right now so I just thought I'd step outside to get a little bit more privacy than inside so um but yeah what you just said was like a great little um segue into my thing because I kind of have that in here somewhere about giving to others um, and sort of like putting that above taking care of yourself as well, which is super hard. And I have family members who are disabled. I have had a family member be incarcerated and kind of had to step up and take care of things. Um, and not really because I wanted to, but because it was just, you know, it was the best option 
in a, a sort of um, unfortunate situation. So um, it's more, what I wrote is more about the emotional taxing that, that I pay for the things that I have to do that you don't really plan for mm -hmm. um, in life. Here goes. <laughs> Worry weighs me down, tallying up the tons of trying times, unmeasurable. A demon of despair sits on my chest as I count the trauma, a taxing I cannot afford on minimum wage, giving time and attention, sweat equity, as I give to others before bestowing basic needs upon myself. Mind racing, out of breath before my head hits the pillow, I count my blessings. The scale still tilts towards sorrow for the masses. Lumps in my throat, holding back tears. What can I do? Empowered, yet still powerless. I do what I can. Will it ever be enough? That's it right there. You know, um, I totally relate to that as far as feeling like I'm not doing enough. Like, like, like how he was, Muhammad Ali was always about the scale, right? Like, oh, the good versus the bad, the good things and the bad things. And I always feel like the bad things are outweighed by the, the bad things outweigh the good things. And I'll never do enough to make up for whatever bad things, or I'll never do enough to be, to be in that, that golden group. Absolutely. And it's all about perspective and you want to try to be positive and you want to try to be grateful, but then you also want to be aware and you want to be conscious and you want to be tapped into everyone else's situations and not just your own personal trife. And when you open yourself up to the world and all of the, the shortcomings of different um, communities across the globe, it's heavy yeah. on top of your own personal shit. And you're like, I can barely take care of myself, my friends and my family. And here I am worried about a community of people in a country that I've never been to. And it's hard to feel like it levels out in any positive way. It always feels like the bad is so heavy and the little bit of good is so few and far between. And it's hard, it's hard to catch your breath when you let yourself be that aware but you also know that being aware is sometimes the best thing that, that you can do yeah so yeah it really funny. is um nurses specifically are terrible at taking care of themselves um like we joke about that it's just part of the reality that we live it's you know and doctors I guess are also the same like we just we're like, oh, we're just going to be broken and abused by the time we retire. That's why, you know, um, you know, they get paid so much, I guess. But like, it's, it's, it's um, that whole caregiver phenomenon. And it really, it's like you said, you know, it doesn't matter if this is like a child that you're taking care of because they have nowhere to go. And so you're like, well, you can come stay with us because that's what you do. Right. Or an, or an elderly person. Nobody sets out. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody sets out to be like, oh, I'm just going to pile my plate full, like overflowing of stuff that I can handle. <laughs> it just works out that way sometimes. But being mindful of the toll that it takes on you is a tiny step in recognizing and honoring the sacrifices that you make to make your little corner of the earth better and that is so healing and powerful um, yeah and owning that struggle is empowering in its own way and it's even if you feel like you could always do more or it's never cured the problem fully it's like taking those small victories and and just chipping away at it every little bit that you do is better than avoiding it altogether yeah I definitely um have to be reminded a lot to take care of myself and to to be kind to myself and like you know um 
I still don't believe that I do enough, you know, and that's just, that's just, I think part of being um, an empathic person, you definitely are that. <laughs> and, um, you know, you do, you want to, you want to fix and, and heal and help others and make the landing a little bit softer if you can. Um, I used to think that I wanted to work in end of life care. And it was a long time of being away from people um, that were almost always dying before I realized the toll that it took on, on me psychologically. Um, but yeah, it does, it takes a real toll. And, and um, it's such an honor to participate in that part of somebody's transition. But, um, you know, you, it's such an effort also to make that a peaceful and comfortable place. And um, that's true for the things you were talking about too, you know, for somebody being incarcerated, for somebody going through medical crisis, or um, they need people at home. You can't just always go to the doctor, <laughs> you know, like they- or just for the daily life stuff, if they can't, do for themselves um and it's hard because I you know I I didn't get my own dishes done you know like every week but or every day or whatever but I have family members who are incapable physically of doing that for themselves and so it's hard when you have to you know pick and choose between you know with your your work schedule and your free time you know am I going to prioritize doing my own dishes or am I gonna go and and take care of someone who's dear to me um and then the time is limited too so you don't know how many years more they're even going to be around for them to need you to do their dishes for them and how am I going to feel when that time comes and I passed an opportunity to take care of them or and also so how am I going to feel if I took care of them and I let my own stuff pile up? So it's definitely yeah. like this really intense daily tug of war between caring for others and caring for yourself. And, and I, yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> it never I definitely like I um, am working right now um, in just honoring the effort that I put in and the intention and the um, amount that I can give. And, um, and then I try very hard to also be like, okay, but what if that was me? <laughs> right. And like, and then I'd be like, oh yeah, no, I would totally be way nicer to that person. <laughs> I would be way nicer to me if I was in that situation. So then I have to go, okay, well then you got to be nicer to you. You got to like, also like that has to be part of the service that you pay to, for your room on this earth. Is and it's a delicate yourself. situation a lot of times too, because pride comes into play and there's a lot of people who don't want to ask for help or don't want to admit that they need it. Yeah. And then there's these levels of guilt where it's like, you know, I can feel guilty if I don't help, but my father can feel guilty for, for needing it in the first place and coming to a place where you can set that, that pride and that ego aside and, and just be there for one another. Yeah. Because and that, um, that definitely happened with my parents, with my mom and my stepdad. Um, the poem that the first poem I read um, was about my mom taking care of my stepdad when he was um, just about paralyzed. He ended up becoming paralyzed and passing away from his illnesses. But, um, you know, that was a very difficult time in their relationship because his needs were getting to be more than she could manage. And it was just going that way and that was like there was no magical surgery or pill or anything that was going to change that that was just the reality and um trying to live in a relationship where um it was equal 
when it so obviously was not equal, um, you know, that I can't, I can't really imagine that, you know, I think about it sometimes, but I can't imagine being in that position. Yeah. So, thank you so much for sharing, Jazz. Thank I'm you. so glad. I appreciate everyone's time and I am probably going to go back inside because it's freezing here. Where are you? Are you I am home? in Old Town Eureka, by the oh way, <laughs> right yeah. by the bay where the wind is as chilly as it gets. It is cold today. It's been really cold. Re like, like the last few days, I've been thinking a lot about um, our houseless population in Eureka and, and the surrounding areas and hoping that folks are getting enough blankets and feeling warm yeah. because even with the sun out the wind is yeah. just icy yeah and it's it's only the beginning of the yeah. of the cold season I mean I'm complaining about my heater being broken in my car but at the same time I work in old town and and seeing people sleep on the streets and it's the same feeling of just like man I'm so privileged and yeah. spoiled I'm like, oh man, it's cold without a heater in my car, and there's people in sleeping bags. I was I'm talking to Harvey about that today. Like yeah, I was talking to Harvey about that. Like, um, I think it was actually yesterday. I was talking to him, and he and he really struggles with that too. And I and I told him I was like, you know, that just there's just going to always be that feeling inside of a person that wants to give everything is is um, that there's just you want to give more and more and more and more. There's always somebody more you know, um, and that's kind of what Muhammad Ali used his platform for, you know, like he was, was very blessed to have so much to give. And it was just such a loving and wonderful, like example of somebody that used all of this wealth and, um, privilege. I, I don't know if I would call it privilege, but definitely wealth and, um, uh, means to be able to, um, just give, turn around immediately and give it, give it all away. Right. You no. Know? Yeah. With the platform of being able to have your message heard on a greater scale. Yeah. And you think about people that have that kind of money right now, you know, and um, what they're choosing to do with it. It's just really different. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm so glad that you shared and that you came out. Thank you so much for coming. And please um, email your, what you wrote. Um, you can do it at the very end of all the workshops if you want. That'd be great. Um, or you can do them piecemeal. It does, doesn't matter because I would love to put what you wrote in our little chapbook that we're going to make. I think yeah, it's I'm really fun. excited about that. And also the um the ink people um maybe katie can answer this question if she's still here yeah um the ink people what do you call that show i don't know uh <laughs> it's gonna be a um a production katie right yeah so it's online okay um, and you said it's art and poetry so i do watercolors as well and sometimes what i like to do is like an abstract watercolor and then um, put the poetry on top of that. So it'll be sort of like a multimedia. Would that be something that would be, okay, great. That would be fabulous. Awesome. I was Sweet. there today talking with them because I feel like our page is a little confusing for people. Um, so I wanna clarify more on the Ink People's page. So what you just said is exactly that's, exactly That's so cool. Beautiful. And the other thing is you could record yourself to anybody who's uh, online. You can record yourself and upload it too. reading your. OK, poem. OK, with a visual of some sort or something like that or just, either way. Yeah. OK, whatever you come up with. I don't. To my knowledge, I don't believe we're going to turn anybody down for anything. <laughs> awesome. So. Yeah, I'll try to spread the word to some of my creative friends as well. Yeah, that would be wonderful. I posted about the workshop on my Instagram, but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Absolutely. thank you so much. And then, yeah, Thursday next week is Will Gibson, and he's doing the following next two workshops. I'm super excited about those. Um, Was he about... here last week? Hmm? Was he here last week as well? Yeah. Yeah, I remember. 
Yeah. So last week, Billy Tuggle actually read one of Will Gibson's poems as one of the prompts for his workshop. Um, and Will comes to all of the workshops. So we all kind of um, are um, going to the workshops and writing and so on. And um, but yeah, next week he will be running the workshop and he has been hosting a little bit at Word Humble lately. Awesome. Um, so yeah, so I'm excited for that one. Um, it's gonna be about um, the meaning of confidence and um, what to do when you don't have any. <laughs> I like that. I'm excited for that for sure. Maybe, so, maybe you can answer this. I know I've, I ha can probably find it online, but do they do open mic nights on Sundays anywhere? Sundays, um, we just have a um, writing workshop from 10 to 12 at Reworded. But that? That's uh, 422nd Street at the Epitome Gallery. In Eureka? Yeah. Okay. 422nd Street in Eureka from 10 to 12. Yeah, and, and it's during the day on Sundays and it's um, similar to these workshops. There's donuts, Ooh. you can come in, it's free. And um, you know, it's like poem, prompt. And that's every week? Every week. Sweet, maybe I'll check that out. Sundays is one of my days off. So I know a lot of the yeah. open mic nights happen on Tuesdays. Weekend. Yeah. and and Thursday like that and yeah. I don't have availability on those days but yeah no the, the Sunday poet. format is a little bit more accessible for me with my with yeah. my stage fright yeah <laughs> the workshops are a lot um less per performative you know it's much more like we're just hanging out um the criticism isn't like actual criticism at all it's more like um uh complimentary feedback yeah <laughs> is how I would put it and um I the, the Sunday one is the one I go to because I really like um starting my day um going to the workshop it's also my day off so I go there I do the workshop I have a donut I drink coffee it's it's awesome it's like almost across the street from Los Bagels so in Old Town yeah oh, okay wonderful yeah well maybe I'll see you there on Sunday Yay. Yeah. Yay. Highly recommend. It's a lot of fun. Awesome. Is that it? Did anyone else want to share? Todd. <laughs> Todd says no. <laughs> Todd. You're muted. I know. All right. <laughs> I'm good. I think. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, sure. I'll, I'll share. Yeah. Um, my good person, one of the many questions asked during the course of our lives, sometimes out of the blue or late at night staring at the dark walls. It's in, it sends us into a deep thought. We look back through the murky haze of memory to find the answers. We see our greatest moments like saying up to that one bully in class who gives bad nicknames, black eyes, stretchy underwear, while victims return change in tears. Or the time we return a wallet or purse to its owner who offers money in return for giving them their lives back only for us to say i did it because it was the right thing to do we're helping little ladies cross the street holding the door open for the person behind giving a dollar to someone who needs it more however we are not perfect and we must look at the other scale look at the bad times such as the time we scream at our loved ones red face spittle words flying as they crouch in corners dodging what is flown fearing the one handy clap that's what i got so far yeah so really that like flippy side of things you know that we all struggle with even if you're a perfect person and everybody just loves you you know everybody goes through this life and experiences things that um they wish they could do over. Yeah. And whether the scales are balanced, I'm a Libra, so I'm all about that balance. Yeah, I thought that was interesting too, that the scales and the and the balance sort of came into play across the board. Because yes. it's not all black and white. It's not all evened out. And you can't just look at it one way or the other. Yeah, you have to have both. Yeah. And owning both is important in valuing all sides of the dichotomy. <laughs> Absolutely. I definitely feel like that is my journey right now. 
I am also loving all of the stuff online about like what personal growth and development actually looks like, because it is not just like, oh, everything is wonderful. No, it's like ugly crying and um, lots of reassurance needed by other people <laughs> and just a lot of like really tough realizations and, um, uh, you know, what that looks that's what it looks yeah. like honoring progress above perfection and 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 accepting that progress is not a gradual progression of continuously getting better you know it's it's a graph of downwards and upwards and plateaus and and honoring that that's all just a part of the process yeah exactly and like for todd for example i've known todd for a long time and he does a lot of social like involvement and stuff like that I, I try I try and do what I can you do a lot you do a lot it's hard um for people that like to sort of that stay behind the scenes um kind of a little bit opposite of Muhammad Ali who was very out in the open and um public with a lot of his um, activities and stuff like that in a very positive way. But um, there's some people that um, just really prefer to sort of be off mic and just silently do the work, you know. And that's how I feel you are, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think Thank that's true. Sharing. Yeah. No problem. Thank you so much, you guys, for coming out. I think we're going to end it a little bit early. Um, Katie, if you want to talk at all about, um, upcoming things, we kind of did that a little bit now, okay. um, or sort of like throughout, but yeah, I think if it's okay with you, we can probably wrap up. Yeah, that's fine. Um, it was a great, I loved everything tonight. Very good. Um, but the art, well, we've got the two with Will, Will, you should talk about what you're going to do. I don't think he's capable at the moment. Okay, all right. Uh, no, I'm I'm good. I'm good. Oh, you're I'm good. good. <laughs> um, well, um, I'm I'm working on a couple of things actually. Hopefully, maybe there'll be a a, a surprise for one of them. Uh, and and but uh, my favorite one that that we're working on is the uh, what I've equated to false confidence is still confidence. Whatever you want to be, be it right. Uh, and and I've worked with that exact prompt for 15 years and have heard a lot of different directions that has taken. And I really want to hear some new ones. Uh, I'm I'm sure people are going to have some very unique perspectives about that exact perspective uh, or that exact thought process. Um, you know, because some people are shy. And just because you want to do it doesn't mean you can do it and all of that. But, um, you know, poetry is a way that you can do that. And that's that's one of the reasons I've always uh, drifted towards poetry, even uh, at the times when I'm not directly uh, influenced by it. I still seek it out in some ways. And I think that's uh, that speaks very well to Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, his, his quote and your quote are very similar. And even Dylan loves that quote because he put it in a poem once. You ever hear <laughs> a poem of Dylan that says, a friend once told me false confidence is still confidence. That's the poem. That's it's right. A poem. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one. <laughs> I think it's in a TED Talk where the speaker says, um, fake it till you become it or something along those lines, instead of fake it till you make it, you know, fake it till you forget you're faking it. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly it. False yeah. confidence is still confidence. You know, if you act like you are supposed to be there, then you're supposed to be there. And, and I try and like use that to guide my life. And, and thankfully it's, it's steered me away from bad things and into good things. It works. It's crazy. <laughs> It's crazy how much it does work, though. It does, and I'm so glad. Thank you, guys. 
so much for coming to this workshop. Uh, I had so much fun and I look forward to seeing you all again on Thursday and maybe on Sunday and maybe also on Tuesday at Word Humble Open Mic, which is always a good time. There's so many things coming up.